This is our sixth week of looking at English translations alongside the Greek text. We've been going through Romans 3. We're in Romans 3.24 this week, and we are going to look at the New English translation this week, the Net Bible. Uh, I encourage you to look at that online. Every now and then I'll mention, look at the Net Bible online. It has very helpful translation notes, both for the Old Testament and the New Testament, often making comments about a challenge or a particular debated issue in the underlying Hebrew and the Greek. So let's read the English translation of Romans 3.24 here. But they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Let's read the Greek text. Tikai umenoi dorean te autu karati dia tes apolutrosaos tes in Christo Jesu. Okay, looking at it, again, we'll translate very literally here and looking back at our English translation of the Net Bible, the New English translation. Being justified freely, being justified freely. And we see this is a participle. It's an adverbial participle of dikaiao, to justify, and it, it is a passive form there. So rightly rendered, are justified. And you'll notice in the English text, the Net Bible has judged that this adverbial participle should be rendered uh, with an adversative sense, but they are justified freely. I think that's probably correct, but it's it's not the only choice. NIV renders, and all are justified freely. The N New American Standard leaves it just being justified. The ESV, and are justified. Uh, the NLT adds in an adversative sense, yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. So we talked about before the challenge. Whenever you have an adverbial participle in Greek, the relationship is usually just implied. Almost always it's implied. But in English, we have to render those more explicitly, usually for understandable English. But they are justified, dota on freely by his grace, through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. So short little verse, very literal rendering with just one interpretive decision. I do want to ask the question, though, if the English word redemption will communicate what Paul meant by apolutrosis, right? The, the lexical form apolutrosis here, the, the genitive apolutrosos. Uh, what, he, what Paul intended by this word, would an English reader understand by the word redemption? So if we went down again to the grocery store and say, what is redemption? I think many people would say, well, that's like where you have a coupon and you, you redeem it for something. You get something back. I'm looking at Donker's abbreviated lexicon here. I'm just going to read so you don't think this is just me reading into it. So here's his little comment on the word apolutrosis. In imagery, it suggests deliverance from enslavement through payment of a ransom, but with a focus on deliverance as such. I know there's some debate. Linguistically, is a payment of a ransom always implied or only sometimes implied? But... I think, I think it, it is implied here. It's not only suggesting deliverance from enslavement. Right? So if we just take that, when people hear the word redemption, are they thinking about being delivered from slavery? Right? I think few English readers are. The question is, how can we render, is there a way to render that to communicate that idea? That's a challenge, isn't it? Or do we just have to communicate those nuances through footnotes sometimes, uh, translational footnotes, footnotes in a study Bible? I want to read Donker's translation or his definition one more time of the word apolutrosis. In imagery suggesting deliverance from enslavement, deliverance from enslavement through payment of a ransom, but with a focus on deliverance as such. Okay, I hope again that our time in the Greek text this week has reminded you that you don't just want to rely on English translations, but you want to be mining the beauty and the depths of the Greek New Testament.